Jason, take it away. Yeah, hello. So as the title says, I'm going to talk about basically a project I've been working on for like a year or so. Um, let's see if this works. So just a little bit of background. I work for Joint, for those that don't know, and two of our big uh, products um, are uh, uh, Trident and uh, Manta. Trident is our cl cloud orchestration uh, software. You can use it to run containers and virtual machines. And then Manta is our storage product, uh, which sits on top of Trident or kind of beside it, depending how you squint. And uh, all those, they work on, they, they're built on top of SmartOS, which is our hypervisor, which is based off of Lumos, which of course then it means there's, uh, you know, we use ZFS, uh, obviously, and uh, you, one of the um, big uh, requests that has come up from customers is uh, protect, you know, protecting data at rest on uh, all of these uh, systems. And so uh, obvious answer is use ZFS encryption. But with that kind of, you know, like with many things dealing with encryption, one of the big challenges is then, okay, well, how do you manage the keys for all of that? And so that's what I've, uh, uh, me and uh, some others have been working on um, how to deal with that within um, uh, Trident and SmartOS. And so um, uh, Alex uh, Wilson uh, came up with the original design and I've kind of been implementing it, but uh, what we're calling the key backup and management. And it's totally not a backronym, so we could call it Kaboom. It's just pure coincidence. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so uh, with that, there's kind of uh, two main components to that. There is uh, what we call in Trident, there's the head node, which is kind of the brains, and there's a bunch of services. So there's the Kaboom API, which is the service there. And then on each compute node, there is uh, a daemon. And kind of the key bit, which is kind of the interesting part, at least what people find um, useful, is that we're using uh, PIV tokens, uh, mostly UB keys, but anything that implements the PIV standard basically to pr uh, protect the uh, key for the Z pool. Uh, one thing that we've done is uh, for each compute node, we just use a single uh, key for the entire Z pool. And so we encrypt the entire Z pool, and that's just because we use uh, so much uh, snapshotting and clones all of our images for containers and for virtual machines are all basically just ZFS send streams that we clone and snapshot. So trying to get any finer grain just doesn't really buy you anything. It just becomes incredibly complex to try to manage. It just uh, for those MMS and ZFS encryption, just because you need to have that um, single um, encryption route for all your clones or whatnot. And so the PIV token, I. Uh, liking it to kind of like two-factor authentication. I have some crypto purists may um, disagree with that, but that's the best way conceptually I think about it in that what we do is we create a random key for the pool and then we encrypt it in uh, what Alex had uh, coined an e-box, so he's not quite sure what the E stands for, uh, which is analogous to kind of, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Diffie Hellman boxes that uh, uh, Daniel uh, Bernstein or G DJB, if you or that, um, in some of his crypto libraries, he came up with the idea. Essentially, you're using public keys, public private key pairs. Um, and I'm glossing over some of the details here, but basically, you use that to encrypt the actual symmetric key that you're using for the pool. So that way, then only the thing with the private key can decrypt it. And so, in this case, with the PIV tokens or UB keys, I can use them interchangeably just because there's some terminology overload. So it makes it a little easier to keep it straight. Um, basically, they, on the device themselves, they have public and private key pairs. And so we use one of those keys to then, uh, our key pairs to protect the Z pool key. And the UB key itself requires a pin before it'll actually decrypt uh, the Z pool key using its uh, private key, which all happens on the device. And so the idea then is that the compute node actually has to have physically have the UB key attached to it, but it also needs to have uh, has to have the pin. And so if it doesn't have both of those, 
then it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. So it's the nice thing versus, for example, just storing all the Z pool keys in one centralized location. Obviously, a downside of something like that would be, of course, OK, if you get access to that, then you, you get the keys to the whole kingdom. And here, even if you were to get all the pins, you would still need all the Yubi keys before you could actually get at all the data. So that you, so that's why I liken it to like two-factor, because it's kind of something the compute node has, the to physical token, and something that it has to know, which is the pin. And so let's see here, let's get to the next slide is a little uh, diagram that tries to visualize it. Um, so basically, during the boot process, um, what happens is uh, early on, we set up the administration network before we import any of the storage. And then if the pool is encrypted, it will um, contact this Kaboom API service uh, to request the pin for the uh, YubiKey that's on the system to basically to provide the pin then to unlock the pool. And um, with that, the request itself actually is signed by the YubiKey, so that has to be present to even get the pin. So someone can't just say, oh, hey, give me the pin to this or to that. Um, and so it actually, the token has to be present. And then once it has that, then it can decrypt it. We can load the key. And, um, you know, the pool is already important, but then we can load the key, then mount up all the file systems uh, that um, are there and kind of proceed on uh, normally. And let's see here, the notes that I, oh. Okay, so um, and kind of during so when we first set up the compute node, uh, we initialize the PIV tokens. When you first get them from the manufacturer, they're blank. There's no keys on them, and so the first thing we do is we have it create the keys, which then they never leave the token, which is nice. Um, just from uh, so you don't have to worry about the leaking. And then we generate a random pin. We register it with the service. And we generate the pool key. We create the e-box to store it, and then we create the z-pool. And then what we do for the e-box itself is just kind of just a serialized structure. And so we base64 encode it and store it as a uh, user property for the root data set on the pool. So then we can just read that. And since it's all encrypted, obviously, without the UB key, without the pin, you, know, you can't, um, again, you can't get at the z you can't decrypt the z-pool key without that. And basically, it contains some additional metadata. So it describes the GUID of the token, as well as um, also some bits for recovery, which is the other piece, which has kind of been the really long part we're working on. Because an obvious uh, problem with that setup, of course, that you know, token gets lost or gets damaged or just gets erased, you know, then what do you do? And so one thing we do have is a um, a recovery procedure where basically it's we do a form of key escrow and so when we create that e-box that i talked about uh, we actually create two copies of the key one protected by the uh, piv token and the other one we split it into m parts and the value of m is decided by the operator as well as a threshold value n uh, which uh, can be less than or equal to m it has to be at least one and so the idea is it's kind of, if you think about if people always like liken it to like the, like the missiles, like the two keys, well, it's kind of like that. Of course, you can have um, N keys. The idea is that the key is split up into M parts and you need at least N of them to recreate uh, the key. And so the idea is then is that uh, employees, or you can put, you know, you can have a safe, like a break glass type thing, depending on what the operator wants to do. Um, where the key is uh, split up um, and protected by uh, PIV tokens that are assigned to people, so like personal UB keys. And then what happens is then there's a challenge response process. Or, uh, so if that does happen, you tell, okay, I need to recover this compute node. And then it'll give you a number of challenge phrases that are um, based on the configuration. Then you get an, uh, however many people that you, uh, you need based off the, uh, your um, whatever policy that you've set, and they do this. Um, they take the cha uh, challenge string. Uh, there's a software that they run on their laptop or their desktop with their own personal YubiKey. They pass it in, provide their own personal pin for their personal YubiKey, 
It gives a response. And once you have n of those, then it can extract the key, unlock the pool, and things can boot up. And of course, at that point, then you can replace the uh, the key with the new one or whatever you need to do at that point so you have the data. So that way, uh, if the token that's on the box is damaged, you know, you still, your data is not gone. Although you should always still have, you know, a separate, you know, disaster recovery backup plan and obviously this isn't a substitution for that but um obviously um it's still we don't um don't uh, don't just want to have a little single point of failure with the uh, ub key um you know the you know leave all the data inaccessible um, and the other bit about that it's we use a um it's the split up is done using a Samir uh, secret sharing scheme, if you're familiar with that. The idea, of course, is that even with, um, like if, say you have 10 parts and your threshold is five, just to pick some numbers, that even having four of those doesn't give you any information about the final key. You have to have at least five so that you can't get like part of it. You know, there's, um, there's no disclosure unless you have you know that that minimum threshold value and um i'm not gonna go into the math that's um behind all that but uh so uh so that also just to uh, try to protect the um uh key and then of course with that you know people you know new people come in people you know, leave organizations people lose their ub keys and so the other thing we had to do is all this all this plumbing then also that you have this policy in terms of you know, how many parts, your threshold value, what those tokens are that you use. And obviously if changes you know, occur just because of all those events, we also then had to write in a mechanism to push out the new, um, uh, up to, in new configurations to all the machines as well and to um, handle that in a manner that doesn't um, leave an opportunity for a machine to become kind of um, hard to recover. So that's also, if you saw me, some of the discussions about using uh, channel programs. And so that's part of why we're looking into that, just because since we're storing this as a property, being able to um, essentially atomically update a property, change the pool key, do things like that, and make sure that it, um, that it either happens or it doesn't, so you're not left in some intermediate state that then requires manual cleanup, just because that's never fun. And so um, that's the basic, that's the very high level overview uh, there. You can get way off into the details. So, um, so that's all that I just want to cover just with the presentation. The two links here are some of the design, the two design documents that go into much more detail. The first one's a more um, theoretical abstract in terms of the concepts, uh, RFD 77. 173 is more into the details. Um, one thing related to this is you know, Kaboomd is actually intended to do more outside of just managing ZFS keys, but that's all that obviously um, I was gonna talk about for this just because that's probably the most re relevant for uh, the people here. So, um, you yeah, but those are, you know, you can freely browse those. Um, and like I said, that goes into far, far, far more detail. Uh, um, and so that's basically it. Like I said, I tried to keep it hopefully short. So if there's any questions. Cool. Thanks, Jason. That, it's really cool to hear about, um, you know, we, I, I think we, uh, we design a lot of stuff, including the encryption stuff, the encryption in ZFS to be able to do anything. Uh, but a lot of times it takes a bunch of work. On top of that, to make it, uh, you know, solve real problems. So it's really cool to hear about how you know you've done that with the encryption stuff. Um, we do have time for questions if anyone here has them. I know there's uh, some folks online. Yeah, and I mean, usually it's kind of kind of the two-factor bit using the UB keys is kind of that seems to uh, interest most people because that's kind of also maybe the most um, I would say different or maybe a unique thing about it. Um, and again, kind of the threat models here were things like, 
you know, someone steals the drive, someone steals the server, or, you know, you dispose of the drives and you're just trying to protect the data. Obviously there are threat models that this doesn't cover um, and those things uh, that we deemed um, were kind of uh, uh, out of scope or just you know, you know, something that you know, our customers, you know, didn't consider it, you know, a threat for, you know, worth putting in the effort because you know, there's always a trade-off. And so, um, It's usually the bits, and I've done demos before, although they kind of are anticlimactic because the whole point with all these integration and everything is that it should pretty much look and feel just like the you know, like it, the encryption wasn't there, that it's hopefully all in the background and things work. And so then uh, when I do that, it's like, okay, I set the compute node, you tell it's encrypted instead of not, then it sets everything up and it's like, okay, aside from doing you know, like a CFS get, or whatnot, it all looks the same. So it's um, uh, always joke that it's kind of an anticlimactic demo just because, oh, it looks exactly the same everything I've done. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I have one question, which is, um, so I get that the, like each, each computer has the um, YubiKey like basically permanently installed in it. So it can, like if it reboots, it's going to request the key re request the uh, pin from the pin server. Um, is the pin server uh, like how do you manage the pin server? It, like it, if that dies and reboots, then does it also just come back automatically, or is that more of a like an event where it needs manual intervention? Um, it's kind of the, the the bootstrapping problem. Basically, um, that service runs on the head node, and for that. Uh, initially, at least, what we're um, looking at is because obviously there is no service then for it, is that depending on what the operator wants to do, um, either they would need to just um, uh, have to enter the pin for the YubiKey for that head node on the console or through like, you know, uh, you know, I, you know IPMI, or if they are comfortable with it, they could put it in a file that it could load it up. Obviously there's the security implications for that. Um, we may look into um, other techniques to um, uh, alternate uh, to secure the, the head node, uh, just because uh, one of the reasons for choosing YubiKeys uh, versus say like an HSM is that um, they're like an order of magnitude cheaper. You know, Yubi keys are 40, 50 bucks versus 500 each, which of course, you know, times a few thousand machines or more, you know, adds up. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the head notes, since that's, you know, one or two machines, you know, it's a little easier to justify, okay, you could maybe look at other solutions which are maybe a little more expensive to um, uh, manage or protect things for that, that you maybe you don't use for the, you know, the, um, the rest of the nodes. And there is some discussion about that actually in RFD 77. Um, with that again, just trying to you know, trade off and trying to, you know, to optimize because obviously you know, the people don't, um, you, know, you don't want, don't want to have encryption be like, oh yeah, but it's going to chart, you know, cost you an extra, you know, thousand dollars per compute node. Yeah. Since that adds up. Cool. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question for Jason, if there are any. Okay, then. Thanks a lot, Jason. Okay. Stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks, thanks for making it here. Uh, I hope you're feeling better.